um, will be a discussion on hip pain treatment options. Um, and our movie star this evening will be Tom Cruise. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Dr. Dillman. Um, and it's presented by Aspirus Review Joint Center. My name is Cindy Sullivan. I am the Joint Care Coordinator for Aspirus Riverview Joint Center. Um, I'd like to share a few facts with you regarding our Joint Center before Dr. Billman gets started. There we go. Okay, our program has been very, very successful. We average about 325 uh, joint replacements per year. Um, all of our patients have a rapid recovery, about 99% of them transition to home. Um, we are the top 10 of all Wisconsin hospitals for surgical safety. We are ranked number one in Wisconsin for many of our outcome metrics. Some of those include surgery time, uh, distance walked after surgery, uh, knee flexion uh, and extension. Um, so we're very proud of those metrics. We've had 0% hospital complications. We exceed the state um, and national average on walking distance and knee range of motion. And we are below the national average for surgical site inf uh, infections and readmissions to the hospital. Thank you. Um, we'd like to brag a little bit. Uh, this is a map of Wisconsin. All of the small dots on the map indicate where patients have come from um, to have their joint replaced with us. Um, so as you can see, it's pretty spread out. And if I am correct, Dr. Dillman, I think we have patients from Chicago area and Minneapolis. Yeah, so the word is out. We do have a very good program, very, very good surgeons um, that do a great job with joint replacements. Um, so our goal with our joint center is to get your life back. We want to get rid of that chronic pain that you're having, the stiffness, the decrease in motion. And these are symptoms that you do not need to live with. We want to get you back to walking, golfing, um, riding bicycle, swimming, all of those things are something that you can do after you have joint replacement. Uh, when your pain, stiffness, swelling, limits joint movement and is persistent or unusual, um, see an orthopedic specialist. Um, they will correctly diagnose you and discuss some treatment options with you. Um, after the seminar, I do have a sign-up sheet in the back. If anybody is interested in scheduling an appointment, um, you can write your name on that list with the phone number and Dr. Dillman will take that back to his clinic and they will have someone call you to schedule an appointment. Um, I also have this nice little pamphlet in the back. It is called Guide to an Orthopedic Specialist Evaluation. And it is a nice little pamphlet that has information um, to help you prepare for that appointment with Dr. Dillman. It has questions on there that he may ask you that you can prepare for and also questions that you can ask him. So if you are interested in any of that, they are on the back table. All right. And then I would like to present Dr. Todd Dillman. <laughs> Friday fish fry or to get the prime rib on Saturday, but 
really here we have everything under the same roof. We have everything within a hospital that, quite frankly, is rated in the top two hospitals in the state for joint replacements. We have hospitals coming to us to ask how we do joint replacements, how we solve the problem, how we get patients motivated and moving with very low risk and very low complication rates, and our outcomes are much better. So that was just a video of a patient. She had both of her hips done about six weeks apart. A young woman who went back to working uh, pretty quickly thereafter. Okay, so can everybody hear me in the back? No? Yes? A little higher? Yeah. All right. Better, worse, same? Doesn't matter? All right. I'll hold it then. All right, so first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for coming. Hopefully this slide deck uh, goes as planned, but slide. So thanks so much for coming. Obviously, it's nice outside. Weather's great and uh, it's starting to turn here, but I appreciate you spending the time with, <coughs> time with us here. So go ahead, slide. So my background, I was born and raised in Wisconsin in a small town in the, kind of the southwest corner, north of La Crosse. I uh, had no idea what I was going to do with my life, so I went out to college and became a Spanish major. Well, in West Central Wisconsin, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So I decided to go back to school and uh, got a master's in physical therapy. I worked as a physical therapist for a bit, and that really wasn't my cup of tea. And went back and got my medical degree from Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee, then I went on and did my orthopedic surgery training down and training down in Illinois. After that, I joined Wisconsin River Orthopedics here in town in 2006, so I've been here for almost 13 years, and uh, it's hard to believe, but it's, it's gone fairly well. So why come here? This is a fantastic picture. If anybody remembers this, it's actually made the national news. This is our ER here. This is the ER, right next to the ER door where that car went in and did say doctor parking. So that made the national news. When you need to get to the ER, there's a direct route. So now they've actually built, obviously, the new ER, which opened earlier this month, which is a fantastic facility. It's hopefully you'll never get a chance to be in it. Uh, but no, this was actually true. They fixed the wall and life went on. So go ahead. So why come here? Go ahead, slide. These, I know they're a little bit blurry, but just take a look at this. This is pretty impressive. Go ahead, slide. 100 best joint replacement centers in the country. This is not us two different more. These are at the healthgrades.com, independent organizations. From 17, 18, and 19, they only listed back three years on their website, but prior to that, I did a, a Spirit of Women talk here in this room, um, and that was probably three, four years ago. I was never invited back, so I don't know if it went well or extremely poorly. But then, uh, once again, same thing, orthopedic surgery. So this is joint replacement. This is just general orthopedic surgery. So we're rated at the highest level by healthgrades.com. There's another company called Consumer Reports that they can't use for marketing and advertising. They won't let you unless you pay them. But we were rated, they did the state of Wisconsin and hospitals in the state, and we were their highest rated for hospitals in the state for orthopedic care. So pretty impressive, yes, tuning your own horn, but realize that they don't necessarily do it better up the road. They may do it similar to what we do, but we have at least the uh, credentials to back it up. Okay. So today's plan, what are you gonna talk about? Like any good medical talk, you first kind of start with the basic anatomy, and then we'll talk about what hip problems are. We're going to cover only a couple as far as diagnosis, surgical treatment. We do have to touch on non-surgical treatment. I know it, as a surgeon it drives me a little bit crazy, but we have to at least try non-surgical means. Not every time you walk into an orthopedic surgeon's office or even an operation. And then last, we'll obviously have time for questions at the end. So hip anatomy 101. This is essentially just a look at the pelvis from the front. Obviously hip, right hip, left hip. Right hips over there as you're looking at a patient. Just a zoomed in view. And then this is just a label diagram. What I want to focus on here is obviously you have the ball in the socket, but you also have this rubber ring inside called the labrum. It's essentially basically like ear cartilage, kind of feels like that in consistency. And that can cause problems inside the hip joint as well. We'll talk about that and obviously like any thigh bones connected to the hip bone, connected to the pelvis. So it's like the muscles around the hip, this will become important later when we talk about surgery as to where you go in, but just obviously there's a lot of muscles in the thigh and around the pelvis that we try not to cut off 
or irritate or bother or, or anything like that when we do an operation. It doesn't matter what the operation is. You want to not try and disrupt those muscles. So, uh, this picture I put up here because this uh, trochanteric bursa here on the side of our hip, we're going to talk about that and a little bit towards the end, but it's the same image, just showing some muscles that go over the top of the hips with that bursa. So how do you treat something? Like anything, you need to know who your enemy is, right? Doesn't matter if you're fighting a war, doesn't matter if you're trying to fight an infection or fight uh, a problem in the body, you need to know what you're treating. So you need to get an accurate diagnosis. How does it happen? It doesn't happen if you're sitting at home trying to think it's gonna get better on its own and it's been two years and it hasn't. So it starts with a phone call. Whether that phone call be to your medical doctor, your primary care provider, or to us as orthopedic surgeons, that's completely up to you. There is completely the falsehood that you need a referral. You do not need a referral, I'll say that 10 times. You do not need a referral to come see orthopedic surgery, to see a surgeon. That used to be back years ago with HMOs, but they realized that actually cost people more money than it saved, and so they reverted that back where you can just come see us directly. Obviously, a physical exam, x-rays, and I know a lot of you can't see it down at the bottom, but it says MRI, CT scan, high-end imaging type things, often not necessary. So if you're at you know, your primary care provider's office or seeing somebody and they immediately want to get an MRI before getting an x-ray or referring you on, I would question if that's a necessary evil. I think that's probably going to be a waste of about $4,000 for you and for your insurance company. So. If, whether that be hip, knee, shoulder, or whatever, I wouldn't run in and do an MRI anytime soon. Uh, the information you get on that's not necessarily the uh, panacea or the end all. So the main thing is the discussion here, the questions that come up, where does it hurt, when does it hurt, how does it hurt, how do you make it better, what have you tried, those types of things are probably 90% of the diagnosis. The x-ray confirms a lot of things. First, it confirms you're not crazy. Um, because hopefully they go together what your complaints are and, and uh, what the x-rays show. And then uh, from there you make a plan. And that plan is a plan of a discussion with the options that are out there. So this is an important key slide. What are the complaints of hip pain? Where does it hurt? First and foremost, it's in the groin. Hip pain is in the groin. People will talk about a muscle pull or something like that where they pulled their groin muscle, that's where the hip pain typically is. They'll say it's difficult to get in and out of the car and clearly groin pain. You're not catching that, you'll get it one more time. And then difficulty putting on socks. People will say, I can't put on my shoes or my socks, somebody needs to help me uh, because of I've, I've lost motion. My leg doesn't move like it normally should. Groin pain and the last one down at the bottom that you can't see is flexibility of the hip. You basically just lost the mobility as to how, do th how to do things throughout the day. These are not hip problems. It's really intriguing what people consider their hip. And that's just human nature, right? Many people come and say, my hip hurts, and it hurts right here. Many people will say, my hip hurts, and it hurts here, and goes all the way down my leg. Butt pain is typically not a problem with the hip. Butt pain is typically not a problem with the hip joint itself. This is low back pain. This is low back pain. So pain that somebody gets here is not the hip. Here is not the hip. More often than not, the rule of thumb is if, it, if the pain is from the side of your hip where that bony prominence is to the front, it's probably a problem with the joint. If it's from that place back, it's probably a problem with the spine or the back. So we spend a lot of times educating patients that when they come in for hip pain and they tell me it hurts here or it hurts here down the leg that the problem's not their hip. I am not a spine surgeon, thank goodness. Um, the, uh, so I can't really help this pain that goes all the way down the foot. And people get really disappointed when they come to see you because they want to help, you want to help them with their hip and they want to be helped, but if it's not the hip, there's not a whole lot you can do. So important is these are not true hip joint problems. Numbness and tingling, numbness and tingling down the leg that goes to the foot, goes to the knee, um, starts in the buttock or wherever, <coughs> is not caused by your hip joint. The nerves that cross, go down your leg do not cross in the hip joint, so almost never are those problems coming from the hip itself, and pain that goes past the knee. Hips, certainly hip joint problems can cause knee pain,
but the pain doesn't go, go past the knee, so that's important. If the pain goes past the knee, from the buttock or the hip all the way down, it's probably not the hip joint either. So, today's discussion, what we're going to talk about, we're talking about three diagnoses, probably the three diagnoses we see most often, um, minus a couple, but the slide I stole off the internet said five, so I had to correct it. We're only doing three tonight. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about a labral tear. Remember that piece of cartilage we saw inside the joint, inside the uh, socket that's like our ear cartilage? We're going to talk about hip bursitis briefly and hip arthritis. Uh, if you took these in order, it's probably reverse order. This is the least common next, and then hip arthritis is obviously what most of us are probably going to get at some point, being that we're living longer. Go ahead, slide. Uh, slide again. So what's a labral tear? If you can see this, this is basically that same picture of the pelvis with the socket pulled away so you can look inside the socket. That's that white ring or that labrum. And what can happen is that labrum can tear away from the bone or it can tear away from deep inside the socket. What does that cause? It causes groin pain, as we've said. Joint problems cause groin pain. It typically occurs in the younger population, in runners, um, contact athletes, those types of folks. But it's typically a sudden onset of groin pain where they can't or have to limit their running or limit their activities. It doesn't nearly cause the loss of motion, like a hip arthritis or something like that, but certainly it is debilitating, no question about that. It hurts and they can't do what gives them their endorphin release, they can't run like they want to. Go ahead. So how do you treat a labral tear? Well, these same things, orthopedics is pretty darn easy if you think about it, right? You either medicate it, you cut it, or you leave it alone. Those are the three options you have. And it's broken down to that. So, um, so, labral tear treatment. First is, if it hurts, don't do it. Activity modifications. That's the common sense doctor joke. If it hurts, just don't do it. Time. Time heals a lot of things. Uh, it's amazing. Um, I have a rule for my children that it, if it hasn't hurt for six weeks, don't tell me about it. Because most of those things are going to go away. And uh, you can treat things with benign neglect in orthopedics very much. So, and it doesn't cause any long-term issues for the most part. If you wait three years, that's a different story. But labral tears, often they can improve or, or calm down on themselves. When I say oral medications, I mean they alleviate the ibuprofens, the Motrins, things like that. A steroid injection is basically an anti-inflammatory to the joint, and it's just trying to calm down the inflammation as well. And uh, PT has good literature, physical therapy has pretty good literature that they can help with uh, different problems with labral tears. I have one therapist at our clinic that really likes to see the labral tears. Slide. How do you treat it surgically? Well, if it's torn, you have two options. If anything's torn in the body, you have two options. You can cut it out or you can repair it. So it's simple. So some labral tears are not fixed. You can do it arthroscopically. <clears throat> arthroscopically, you would just shave out the torn portions. Some are repaired and you repair it typically, this is kind of a not a true repair, which we do, but you would repair it with suture, drill, or uh, anchors, and suture, and you'd repair it back. Typically, that's the, at this point in time, it's done arthroscopically through little poke holes around the hip. In the, when I learned in training, we did it as an open dislocation, and that's really not done anymore. Uh, they're not very often, at least. Arthroscopically, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to do it here at Riverview. Um, we don't have any. Uh, we don't have the equipment for a hip arthroscopy. So if somebody does fail conservative management after a after a labral tear, we unfortunately do have to send you to a different facility that has it. The issue being is the equipment is extremely expensive, and we don't see enough in town to do it. If I don't do it proficiently on a frequent basis, I don't think you want me doing it on you. I mean, I'd love to learn and try, but if I'm only doing it once every six months, I think that's probably the wrong thing for the patient. So. That's true for the rest of us in our clinic as well. Um, but there are great surgeons that do this arthroscopically, and uh, they can get it fixed. But we would just have to send you to another facility if that was the case. But hip bursitis. This is truly one of the banes of my existence <coughs> in all orthopedic surgeons. So, um, hip bursitis is this cushion. A, a bursa is basically a cushion. We all have bony prominences on our body, whether it be the elbows, whether it be the front of the knees, whether it be the side of the hips, or in the shoulders, wherever. Bursas are these cushions that essentially cushion the bone from 
tendons, outside world. Scan things like that. It's like this can happen to anybody. This is this is, doesn't discriminate who gets it. It can be the active young patient. It can be the elderly sedentary patient. It can be patients with hip arthritis. Hip bursitis is truly, truly there in extreme high prevalence. And it's, I don't say it's difficult to treat, but it uh, it can be recurrent or recalcitrant means basically it just keeps coming back. This is the problem. Low back pain. People with nerve impingement in the low back, they'll come in and they'll be bursa. They'll feel like it's their bursa or the problem is their bursa on the side of their hip. However, you treat it with the things that you normally treat with and the pain doesn't go away. It just kind of continues to be there. Everything you try doesn't work. Then many times the problem is actually a nerve getting pinched at L4, 5 in the low back. And once again, then that's, that's a problem. And that's why it's difficult. A lot of times you treat it and life goes on and it goes away. But if you have one that just won't go away, sincerely, you've got to look towards the spine as the uh, source of the problem. It's like. So symptoms. For bursitis, it typically hurts on the side. We all have that bony prominence on the side of our hip. If people will say they can't sit in a hard chair, so the bursa people are the ones wiggling in their seats right now. Yeah. Laying on the affected side. If you lie on that side, you have difficulty rolling over at night just because it hurts. Stairs are difficult. Um, once again, it's not associated with numbness or tingling or any problems past the knee. Sometimes the pain starts up here on that bony prominence and goes down just to the outside of the knee. But typically does not, it will not extend down to the toes, ankle, calf, things like that. So how do you treat it? This is probably the best picture of it that I could find. It's essentially the outside of your thigh is where you're going to get the bursa pain. Focused right where his hand is, kind of where that bony prominence is. Picture on the right just shows once again, it shows it inflamed down here on the side. So how do you treat it? Well, like all everything in orthopedics, it's activity modifications. We see this sometimes in runners that always run on the same side of the road. There's obviously a, a camp to the road or a pitch to the road. So if they're running the same side, they continue to irritate one of the verses and they continue to run, that problem's not going to get better. So you would basically have them run with traffic or run on a different side of the road or run elsewhere. Um, benign neglect, you can treat it with time, oral medications, once again, are anti-inflammatory medications. Stretching, this is the mainstay of treatment for bursitis. This is probably the most important one that you would do. It's stretching recurrently throughout the day. So for this problem, her bursa problem's on the left side. So she's stretching her left hip, IT band and bursa try and stretch that out so there's not so much pressure on that cushion or on that uh, sack. If you get the pressure off the sack, the pain can get better. Physical therapy helps quite often. If you can't get the stretching to work, if the medications don't work, if benign neglect doesn't work or activity modifications, often we would send you to therapy. Um, otherwise, lastly, there's an injection. It's like the injection is essentially like taking all the anti-inflammatories and the proxen ibuprofen. That's all the steroid injection is. The steroid injection is simply anti-inflammatory medication. That's what a steroid is that we use. And it goes into the sac for the bursa. It's essentially just taking the inflammation out. There's no magic to that. It's basically trying to deliver what you would take by mouth at the source. So you can take the ibuprofen or leave. And those medicines get spread throughout the body, right? It goes in the bloodstream, it goes throughout the body. So this is just a more direct way to do it. Steroid injections into the bursa, yeah, they hurt, but typically it takes about two weeks for the problem to go away and you feel much better. So the standard patient that comes in, kind of a bursa patient, kind of the standard algorithm that we do is obviously activity modifications, medications, and most people have done that by the time they come see us. And then often we'll say, okay, let's inject it today if you're not better in two weeks, then we would do therapy. Because the steroid injection takes about two weeks to take effect. It's not instantaneous. It means to take the inflammation out. And so then, if that didn't work, we'd send you to therapy at two weeks. And typically, well more than 90% of the time, that takes care of the issue. Uh, but obviously, like I said, it can't come back. It doesn't make you immune from the problem coming back once it goes away. Slide. All right, so now the uh, kind of the bulk of the talk. Any questions on those two? Lunch. All right. 
So, <laughs> may have to turn the lights back on. Or <laughs> All right. All right. We're talking about hip arthritis. Go ahead. So, same type of thing. Anatomy. The anatomy of the ball in the socket. Pretty basic anatomy. It's it's the rest of our body is really similar, but the difference is, is this is an extremely deep socket. If you think of a shoulder, a shoulder has is like a golf ball on a tee. It's a very shallow socket, whereas the hip is a very deep socket. And so bone spurs and problems with the hip joint really limit the motion very quickly. But, so this is what arthritis looks like. Basically that smooth white covering or cartilage on the ball starts to erode away. There are well more than 100 different types of arthritis that happen in the body. Um, I am clearly not an expert on that. I see the end stage of what it happens, and that's joint erosion. It affects a lot of people every year, and the two types that obviously are the most common are rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, with osteoarthritis by far exceeding everything else. Osteoarthritis is, is essentially what people will call the wear and tear of the joints. Um, basically, you wore it out. It, it's probably about, I don't, know, I don't know the exact stat, but I'd say it's probably about 80% what mom and dad gave you. 15% what you do in life and 5% just bad luck. And uh, that's true for probably most things in healthcare, I guess. But it truly is an erosion of the joint, the end erosion that causes the pain. Bone spurs do not cause pain. We'll show pictures a little bit of that, but bone spurs themselves don't cause pain. This is what causes pain. When I expose the bone here and bone there, it's extremely sensitive and that's what hurts. So the bone spurs themselves, you could go chisel the bone spurs off all day, but you still have this problem. You still don't have any cushion. So that's where the problem comes in. So going out and uh, taking the bone spurs off is not a solution to the problem. We all often will get hung up on bone spurs. As Doc says, I got bone spurs. Well, that you have to have to have arthritis by definition. So what are the symptoms? Once again, groin pain. Hopefully we're catching on to that one. Stiffness, immobility, limp, and a waddling gait. Waddling gait basically just means if you, uh, are really bored and you're at the mall and you see somebody walk and they kind of uh, throw their body over to one side the whole time. I can't do this one. It's, it's basically they got a bad hip on the side they're throwing themselves over to. Now, if they walk like the penguin, that's probably a hip problem on both sides. So I, uh, I really hate going to the mall so I just sit there with my camera, phone or camera and I literally just record people walking because you can learn a lot. And that allows me not to go shopping. So, but no, it's really neat. So you can, I mean, it's a very predictable gait. One of the things we all often do at the clinic, and people don't think much about it, is if the surgeon or the physician is standing at the end of the hall, they're not standing at the end of the hall because they don't have anything to do. They want to watch you walk in or walk out. You learn a lot by watching somebody walk without them knowing you're walking. If I ask somebody to get up and walk, well, you know where they're they're going to they're going to modify what they do. So. Usually, I just if I tell you that, hey, what you get up and walk, it's because I'm done. I'm done, and I just want you to leave. The worst I walk out the door. And so that's, that's pretty much I'm done at that point. But no, so watching somebody walk without them knowing will tell you a lot about what the problem is, whether it be their knee, their ankle, their hip, those types of things. And so there's a lot of mimickers of hip pain, whether it be spine issues or knee problems. Uh, all of those things become uh, important, and watching somebody walk is a difference maker in that. So this is kind of the standard x-ray that we see. This has been shown at many, many conferences here. So if you've been here before, you've seen this. This is just a normal ball and socket. You have a nice round ball. The space between this socket and the ball is the cushion. It's not really a space in real life. Whoever designed this, we don't have spaces in our body. Everything's pretty well tight knit. This is a hit arthritic hip. That space above that ball is now gone. You have a somewhat round ball, but not really. It's more egg-shaped as it comes up and flattens out over the top. You can imagine this hip, when somebody brings this thigh bone out to the side, kind of out to the side that way, there's plenty of clearance. It'll keep going. If you try that same thing with this, as you bring that thigh bone out to the side, that's going to want to hit there and your motion is going to be limited. So your motion becomes limited based on the shape of the ball or bone spurs, those types of things. But the pain itself comes from the bone rubbing on the bone, or the lack of cushion, however you want to word that. But this is a pretty standard x-ray of a hip. These are essentially bone spurs here, and down here in the socket, there's a little bone spur forming here. 
when we get x-rays, we don't just get one standard film. We usually get a pelvis film, so we can compare, compare right and left, as well as different x-rays on just the uh, hip, the affected hip that we were there talking about that day. Next slide. I'll go back to that, please. Just one thing about labrums, we talked about the labral tear. This will not show any problems with the labrum. So that's the one exception for MRIs, CT scans, those types of imaging. X-rays don't show soft tissue. Uh, X-rays only show bone. So if somebody does have a labral tear, that would not show up on a standard X-ray. Bursitis would not show up on a standard X-ray. Those types of things would take higher end imaging, uh, MRIs, et cetera. So. All right, so what can be done? How do you treat arthritis? Whether it be arthritis in the hip, whether it be arthritis in the knee, whether it be the back, wherever, the same things apply. Activity modifications, changing the way you do things. Uh, obviously, if you can't put on your socks, you might get one of those sock putter honors, uh, things of that sort, assistive devices. Weight loss, um, weight loss, I have to put it on there. Actually, the government makes us, if you ever come and see me, it's not because I'm trying to be a jerk or point out something that nobody knows, but with uh, the Affordable Care Act and uh, different uh, things, if we don't mention weight loss, really you can't get to the next step with care. So weight loss becomes an important thing. Over-the-counter medications, that's the Aleve, the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, those things. Physical therapy, steroid injections, and the last one there is joint replacement. So anti-inflammatories, I do not get paid from any of these companies, but I filter these off the web. So anti-inflammatories, I typically just use the over-counter stuff. There's no identifiable difference between a prescription anti-inflammatory medication or something that you buy over the counter. They all have the same safety labels in them. They all cause <coughs> GI problems, they all cause kidney problems, and they all can cause heart issues. <coughs> but for them to work, they need to be taken on a scheduled basis. When we take, when you have a headache, we take a medication and boom, the headache's gone and we're done. That's not how this is going to work for arthritis or inflammation for that matter. You have to take it on a scheduled basis and it typically is at least five doses before it reaches a steady state in the body, before it starts to take effect. So somebody who comes in and says, hey, no, I tried ibuprofen or I tried Aleve and it didn't work. I tried it yesterday. Well, that's not really trying it. That's basically a, a, an attempt that failed without using it the way it was designed. What do I typically like to, to st talk about? Ibuprofen or Aleve lasts for about six hours. So you can take that four times a day, and I can't remember to do anything really four times a day. Naproxen or Aleve is twice a day. That's a little bit easier for me to remember. And so I always tell people, if you're gonna do something, take Naproxen with breakfast, Naproxen with supper. That way you're taking it with food, and uh, it gives you 12 hours of relief, so you cover your entire day. So that's one way to do it. However, if you are on these medications, for any prolonged period of time, more than a couple weeks, or if you have kidney problems, or if you have um, uh, problems with your heart or you're on blood thinners, you absolutely need to check with your regular doctor and see if it's okay. Um, I went round and round with a woman today uh, who's unfortunately only got one kidney for other reasons, and she's taking a lot of this medication. Well, that's not a reasonable way to do it, to kill a kidney to make your hip or knee feel better. So really check with your regular doctor if you're on those things for long term. Uh, steroid, once again, the steroid we use basically calms the arthritis or is an anti-inflammatory. So the way we do this is we typically just do it at our, at our clinic. We have an x-ray machine that gives us live feedback. You lie on the table. We put, we obviously sterilize the area and put the needle in the joint. It takes about two minutes of that. Once again, though, that injection takes two weeks to work. But does it solve the problem? Does it take away the arthritis? No. Does it uh, uh, calm it down? Yes. And does it last forever? Probably not. Obviously, if you have mild arthritis or uh, you're of extremely young age, it has an extremely uh, valid use. If you've got arthritis like that x-ray showed earlier, it probably won't last a week or two. So then it becomes, is it worthwhile? Do you do it or not? The other uh, issue with, arth or with the injections uh, becomes frustrating. Hips tend to hurt, 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 and then they go to hell in a handbasket if it's arthritis. If you inject somebody and it goes to heck in a handbasket, you cannot operate, you should not, I should sure you can't, you can do anything you want, but you should not operate for at least 8 to 12 weeks because the risk of infection goes up. 
steroids basically lower the immune system, lower your ability to fight infection. So that's probably the biggest drawback of the steroid is if it does not work, you certainly cannot have an operation for at least two months. Uh, literature is starting to point more towards three. So that's the biggest drawback on that, and it's a poke, obviously the cost and all those things. Uh, the chance of infection is there, but it's extremely rare with the poke itself. Um, the, uh, this is often used, you know, grandparents going on a trip to Disney World, a family vacation, the cruise, things like that, to get by. It'll buy you a couple weeks or a month or two. Uh, might buy you a couple months, but it certainly is kicking the can down the road, which is fine. Which, if you're a young person, that's an absolute thing that probably should be done, but it's a discussion. So when do you consider joint replacement? This is a kind of a cartoon schematic of a joint replacement. But what's done is the ball is removed, but we need to put another ball on. And there'll be a better picture that's higher up for everybody to see. But So we can't just put the ball on the end. We actually have to put a stem down inside the bone and then put a socket in. And I'll show you a video of this that will be higher if you can all see. But when do you do joint replacement? When everything else fails. <laughs> I will never, ever, ever tell a patient, you need your hip or knee replaced. They'll tell us. I don't feel the pain. You can write the number on the piece of paper that says my pain's 9 out of 10, and you can tell me in excruciating detail when it hurts all the time. And I'm going to look at you, and then I'm going to say once again, do you want your joint replaced? And you have to do the kind of the draw the line down the piece of paper on one side, the good and the bad, right? It doesn't matter any decision in life that's big. Is is the pain significant enough where I can't do the things that I want to do on a daily basis that it is worth the risk of an operation? So you have to say that to yourself a couple times because is the pain significant enough that you can't be the person you want to be and you're willing to undergo the risks of an operation? It doesn't matter what operation that is. It's a pretty, pretty strong question. And it had every, every patient I go through that has a surgery, that, that at least exercise is done. And the other thing, obviously, if you can't be the person you want to be, your quality of life is down, and that's when you really want to consider it. Uh, obviously, pain affects sleep, pain affects you know, your personality, whether or not you're ornery all day, those types of things. So um, it's a good reason to do a lot of stuff. It's like, so what are the benefits? If you look at this, I put down, I didn't put eliminate hip pain. The only pain-free person is a dead one, as far as I know. So it reduces the pain. I never, never, never will tell somebody they're going to be pain-free. You'll absolutely, 98 plus percent of the time, with good to excellent results, diminish the pain. But I can't look you in the eye and say you'll be pain-free because you can replace the hip. But guess what? You still have you still have a bursa. You still have tendons. You still have other things around the hip that can cause trouble. Just because you replace the joint doesn't mean you're immune to all the other problems that can happen. So it may enhance mobility and movement. There's a lot of things that go into mobility and function, right? Your agility, those types of things. A lot of times people will come in and say, hey, I want my hip replaced because I just don't feel like I have the balance that I normally do. Well, I'm not going to look that person in the eye and say that I'm going to make their balance better because what goes into balance? Your eyes, your ears your quickness, your muscles, all those things. So the primary goal of hip replacement surgery is to reduce pain. And if you can reduce the pain, hopefully this improves, but it may not, depending on what the other factors are. But it's certainly if you can reduce the pain, you'll increase the quality of life. And our goal is to return to normal activity, low impact sports activities. The only thing I tell people not to do after a hip replacement is take up marathon running and skydiving. It's, you can do it, but you're going to wear the joint out faster. And so that's, it, you're not going to wreck what I did. You're just, instead of uh, it wearing out in 20, 25 years, you'll probably wear it out in 10 years if you take up marathon running or less. It's kind of like the person who drives with two feet. The brake pads will wear out a lot quicker on the person who's driving with two feet because they're running on the brake pads the whole time. So um, it's just wearing out the, the bearing surface faster. Go ahead, Sledge. So this is kind of the basic hip replacement picture. Pelvis, thigh bone, obviously they have the skin there. But if you can see, there's a socket, a metal socket or a shell on the inside. There's a wedge that goes down inside the bone that holds the ball. And then between those two is typically a piece of plastic. There's all kinds of different bearing surfaces. There are all kinds of different hips. 
uh, between like Ford, Chevy, those types of things, there's companies um, that make them. Interestingly, if you ever go to Indiana, which for whatever reason you're in Warsaw, Indiana, uh, 90 plus percent of all the orthopedic implants in the, in the world are made in Warsaw, Indiana. Doesn't matter which company they come from, they're all in one central hub. There will be no extra points for that trigger later. But anyways, so you have a ball and socket and a piece of plastic in the middle. Go ahead and slide. This is kind of a better picture of it. All of these parts are interchangeable. You have a stem, you have a ball, you have a piece of plastic, and then you have a piece of metal. There's all kinds of samples up here of different ones, different shapes, different sizes. But essentially a wedge like this goes down inside the bone. It is sized to the patient at hand. We're not all the same size. You have ones that are a lot smaller, a lot more stout. Um, obviously, your magnification. You can put a larger ball on top. You can use, a, I don't know if I have any up here, but you can use a ceramic ball. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages, but it's more of a discussion. This is essentially the tried and true. This has the longest track record. If you stay up late at night, you can listen to the uh, attorneys talk about if you have a metal on metal hip replacement. What we did at that time, and I say we as orthopedic surgeons, the problem is that this white piece of plastic or yellow piece of plastic can wear out. It's the brake pad in your hip. You can imagine if you walk or run and that ball keeps pounding into that socket, you might wear out that hip a little quicker. But the concept was of the plastic is a weak link. Why not make it a piece of metal? Metal's not going to wear out as well. Well, that came with a bunch of problems, and so we don't do metal on metal anymore. Um, matter of fact, there's, I don't even know if there's manufacturers making metal on metal much anymore. So we use a piece of plastic. There's different types of plastic. Uh, there's plastic that's probably going to wear out 15 to 20 years. There's stuff that's supposed to last 20, 25 years and beyond. So do we use the same piece for everybody? No. Um, it's, you know, we got, as, as surgeons, we have to be cost aware as well. So do you really need a, a really fancy piece of plastic in a 92-year-old that you're replacing their hip? They probably don't need that thing to last 30 to 30 years or 35 years or more. But clearly you're going to use something that's going to last longer in a 40-year-old that you replace their hip. So it's more of a discussion with the patient. If somebody's allergic to metal or nickel, you can still have a hip replacement. This part and this part are titanium. The ball itself does have nickel in it typically, so we would exchange that ball for a piece of ceramic. And then you would walk on ceramic. So the ball becomes a ceramic piece, which is pretty interesting. But nickel allergies certainly can have a hip replacement without any hip allergies. Slide. So here's a hip replacement x-ray. This hip is not perfect, but once again, what you see here is you see a socket, you see a wedge down inside the bone with the ball, and you don't see a piece of plastic. So we talked about that piece of plastic being the weak link. How do you know when that piece of plastic is worn out or shot or 20 years later that you need it replaced? On this image, when you do the surgery, you know how thick that plastic is. So basically you just make sure that that plastic 10, 15, 25 years down the road is essentially the same thickness or the ball is smack dab in the center. Because when it, that ball wears out or that plastic wears out, it's not going to wear out down here. It's not seeing any, any pressure. It's going to wear out here at the superior rim. So that ball will start to migrate north and then when it gets to the point of uh, almost touching metal to metal, you get it replaced. Just like your brake pads. You don't wait for the screech to replace your brake pads, right? If you do, then you got to turn the rotors. So if you do this, if you replace the plastic before you get to metal on metal, surgery is a heck of a lot easier. If you wait till you get this piece of metal rubbing on that piece of metal, there's a chance you've just upstaged a bunch, and when you go in there, you're going to have to replace the socket and the ball. So you've made it a lot more difficult. So we typically tell you, at this point, we say 10-year checks. So if you had your hip replaced today, we'd tell you 10 years from now, we'd like to see you back so we can re-x-ray it, just to make sure the plastic piece is not wearing out. If you're young and active, sometimes we pull that down. If you're a 30-year-old that has their hip replaced for whatever reason, we'll pull that 10 years down a little bit. Um, slide. So there's multiple ways to replace the hip. Um, you can go through the back side. You can go from the front slash outside or you can go directly from the front. The comparison I always use when I get asked this question is, well, what's the difference? Well, what goes in is the same. It's the exact same piece of metal. It's the exact same socket. 
we don't change what goes in based on how you get there. If I asked everybody in this room to write down how to get to Walmart, there'd be a lot of different ways to get to Walmart. But guess what? We're all going to end up there. So whether or not you do an approach from the back, the side, or directly from the front is a matter of surgeon preference and patient preference. The end result is the same goal, gain relief at the hip. But if I told you to get to Walmart and I wanted you to go across the bridge, go to Port Edwards, go down to Dakusa, maybe take a, take a, I don't know, a motorcycle, you're going to have increased risks, right? Versus if you just go to A Street South. One's a direct approach, one you're kind of going in a circuitous or around the corner type fashion. Remember where the hip hurts. The hip hurts where? It hurts in the groin. The groin is clearly in the front. If you look at a pelvis, I don't have one here, the uh, model, the socket itself points to the front. So it makes sense, in my eyes, or at least a lot of surgeons' eyes now, to go from the front. That's called the direct anterior, anterior meaning front. So, but the end result is the same. The goal is the same is to replace the hip. So we're going to go through kind of a little bit, we're not going to do anterior lateral, but we're talking a little posterior, a little bit direct anterior as to how you get there. <coughs> Slide. So the posterior approach, that is traditional. That's what was, uh, what I learned in residency, that was uh, you, about you know, 12 years ago, you heard about uh, minimally invasive surgery. So they developed a mini posterior approach. The incision got a lot smaller in size, and it worked. We were able to, able to replace the hip, but these, the, uh, was, it was essentially the same. You can see the incision on that side. It typically goes on the side of the hip over that bony prominence. It's a little bit longer unless you go with the mini posterior. And it's extremely comfortable for the surgeon. I mean, the surgeon trained that way. They know how to do it. Um, they're probably proficient at it. There's a uh, surgeon in the southwest corner of the state that does hundreds of these a year. And he's extremely proficient at it, a great surgeon. And that's what his comfort level is. So their uh, long-term data is there. You can absolutely look up the data. But uh, disadvantages, I think, that are real. To get in, remember show those muscles around the hip. To get into the hip from the back side, we all got a lot of meat back here. You've got to cut some of that off to get in. It's impossible not to. Because the hip joint itself is towards the front. So you've got to start a little bit at a, on the side or a little bit to the back and work yourself around the corner. It works and it works very well. Where did this, the interesting thing, the history of this is actually kind of cool. So where did this come from? So where did we get most of our influence 60 years ago or 50 years ago? And this is, hip replacement is relatively new in the world of surgery. So it, basically in the 60s it became, 50s and 60s it really came to light. But as Americans we got most of our influence from England. That's just the way it's been for, throughout time. There's a gentleman by the, a gentleman there by the name of Charnley, who became dubbed a knight by the Queen of England for his work on hip replacements. That's the way he did it. And so we followed our English partner's lead, which works, and it's worked for the test of time. Uh, so, the, uh, so that's where the history comes from, but you have to cut tendons. Hip precautions, this is when people will say sometimes, and I put a question mark there, because not everybody does this, but people will say, don't cross your legs, don't bend at your waist. <laughs> uh, don't shave with your leg out to the side, things like that, because you can dislocate the hip. The ball can pop out of the socket. It's extremely painful. It requires a trip to the emergency room, typically, to get put back in. And then, this is a surgery I used to do. I absolutely did this my first couple of years out. Uh, I had uh, one patient that was extremely disappointed with what I did for their leg length. It's uh, a little bit harder in my hands to determine equal leg lengths from this approach for a lot of reasons, but uh, we won't go into that detail. But realize that leg length uh, can become an issue uh, through any approach for that matter, but in my hands this gave me a little bit of trouble with leg lengths. So what's my current practice? Well, when I started here in Wisconsin Rapids 12 years ago, nobody wanted to have surgery with the new guy, so I had all kinds of time. And so, I, and that's true. I am doing all kinds of stuff. I had a lot of golf time. But anyway, so I essentially, at that point, 12 years ago, nobody was doing really, I shouldn't say nobody, less than 1% of the surgeries in the country were done through a direct anterior approach. I called a surgeon down in Texas who had no idea who I was, um, and I called him and asked him if I could come down and sit with him for a couple of days. 
and he graciously accepted. And I went down to that with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Emerson. Doesn't name doesn't mean much, but he's just a fantastic surgeon, elderly gentleman who is as pensive as anybody I've ever met. He thinks about everything from start to finish more than I ever would. But anyway, so I sat down there with him for a few days. We did surgery. We did anterior hip replacement surgery. He showed me what to do, how to do it. And I came back and I did my first surgery when I got back. I've never gone from the back side yet since that time. So 12 years ago was my first one, and I have yet to go from the back ever again. Um, that's a matter of preference. I think there's a lot of advantages that we'll get to. But So what I did 12 years ago, that was the first Biomed, which is a company, anterior hip done in the state. And now since I started doing them that time when almost nobody was doing them, I've been doing that education kind of nationwide as to how to do anterior hip replacements going to Boston in two weeks to teach a, a group out there. What's really intriguing is surgeons actually will come here, it's not to be derogative, but patients, but <coughs> surgeons will come here, or I also work in Black River Falls, to either of those locations to observe us do surgery. So it's actually kind of a cool thing when a surgeon comes in and at least thinks enough of what you're doing to sit there and uh, watch you do the surgery so they can see how it's done. I also, uh, when I go around and teach it's an interesting way to teach. We'll do a didactic session where I'll talk on what to do, how to do, benefits, et cetera, risks, and those types of things. And then each surgeon has a, a cadaver. Uh, and so people have been at least kind and generous enough to donate their uh, body to science or healthcare. And the surgeon gets to practice on the cadaver. And I walk around station to station. Uh, typically, my nurse and I walk around station to station. And we help them do the operation. And that's how you learn. <laughs> Back when I did it 12 years ago, that type of learning was not available because nobody was doing it, nobody was interested. But it works very well. So uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of surgeons have taught how to do it. How many do it, I have no idea. Um, but that's why we get people from Minneapolis and other places. I've taught in Minneapolis at least a half a dozen times in, in Seattle and things like that. So, slide. so once again, what is the direct anterior approach? What does it mean? How do you get there? What do you do? those types of things. <laughs> so the interesting part is I talked about how, first off, it's not new. It's not new at all. The uh, anterior approach was written about uh, years and years ago. Um, it really came to light probably in the 80s. Well, I know in the 80s. A gentleman by the name of Keggy and Mata um, kind of pioneered it here in the US, or they start crediting it within the US. But uh, Mata was a, a, a surgeon who worked on pelvises. He was a pelvis fracture surgeon. And who do we hate throughout the test? Not, I shouldn't say that, that's recorded. Who was Americans drove us crazy throughout World War I to Vietnam? Which country? The French. It was difficult for us at the time. So we didn't get a lot of influence from the French because it was a different language. Right? And so there's that barrier. We didn't have the internet and instant translation and those things. But that's the way they were doing it in Europe, off the island. They were doing a direct anterior approach. But we didn't get a lot of influence for that. So Mata's there, learns how to do it, comes back and starts doing anterior hip approaches, he writes a landmark article in the 80s that says you should replace a hip from the front. And obviously, like anything in healthcare, it doesn't take off right away. Us as surgeons are arrogant, think we always do everything the right way. That doesn't take off as well, much at all. It kind of trickles down to the point where, like I said, 12 years ago, less than 1%. Now we're almost at 20% of hip replacement surgeries in the country are done through a direct anterior approach. So that snowball's starting to roll down the hill it's not just marketing or advertising. I think there's real benefits, and we'll go through that slide. So what's direct anterior approach? This is essentially where the incision is. The patient lies on their back, and the incision goes over the front of the hip. This is a real incision on a hip replacement that I did, just to show kind of what the length of the incision is. That's a little bit less than two inches. So you don't need a giant incision to do this. Obviously, if somebody's a 400 pounder, the incision is going to be bigger, right? Because if you dig a hole, and the hole's going to be a foot deep versus a couple inches deep, you've got to make the top of the hole bigger. So this person, well, that was their incision, which isn't too abnormal. Um, it's anywhere that's whatever, five centimeters, so just about under two inches. So anywhere from five to seven centimeters is kind of a standard incision. The incision doesn't matter, right? It's what you do underneath. All the skin heals edge to edge. So it's what you do down low that becomes important. It's like, so why would somebody as a patient try to do a direct anterior? Well, first off, typically there's less pain and a quicker recovery. 
And that's been shown in the literature for anywhere from six months to two years. So that's a big deal when somebody's got a job and needs to work and return to a family and those types of things. At two years, they probably equal out a post-year and anterior approach if you took all literature that's out there. But starting out, they typically have a quicker recovery. Uh, post-year approach often puts a pillow between your legs, and that pillow's there for six weeks. With this post-year, with this direct anterior approach, that's unnecessary. There's clearly a shorter length of stay in the hospital. There's no need for therapy uh, once you get out of the building. And then uh, there's no restrictions on movement. When I talked about the post-year approach, and some people say don't cross your legs, don't bend at the waist, those types of things. From a direct anterior approach, we give you no restrictions because the chance of dislocation is 0.6% for all comers. That's an extremely low percentage of dislocation. And it typically occurs in spinal fusions in patients with a significant spine problems. So we don't give any restrictions to movement because the dislocation rate is so low. And better leg length control during surgery. You'll see a picture of a surgery, but the surgery for a, of the hip replacement from the front, you're lying flat on your back on the table. So the nurse, my first assistant nurse who's helping me, is measuring your legs multiple times throughout the surgery to measure the leg lengths are as equal as can be. Obviously, we, we, uh, our first goal is a hip that's stable and takes care of the pain. Leg length is a little bit farther down on the list, but you have better leg length control during the operation. So why would I like it as a surgeon? Obviously, if you like it for different things, I want to like it for different things, but the first is no muscles are cut. Um, if anybody, and I'll show that slide in a second, but excellent visibility. One of the knocks, or one of the difficult parts, I think, for some people on a posterior approach, including myself, is to see the socket, or to see what we call the acetabulum. From this approach, you're looking straight at it. Uh, leg length we talked about, reduced dislocation risk. If I can keep the dislocation risk down, it means I get to sleep at night, less phone calls, so that's a good thing. Uh, correct component position. If you look at this x-ray, this is actually, this, these are x-rays at the time of surgery. If you do a posterior approach, getting this kind of feedback is extremely, extremely difficult. From an anterior approach, before I pound that in to get to this, I'm looking at it to see exactly if that's where I want it. From a posterior approach, you don't typically have direct x-ray feedback before you do things. So I know that it's going to be in the right position. Well, what's that benefit to you? If that's in the exact right position that it needs to be, the literature says that the plastic piece is going to last longer and your dislocation rate is going to go down. Those are two very, very big patient satisfiers. Obesity is less of a factor. We talked about a lot of people who got meat on their backside. No, I don't see a lot of fat people right here, right in the front of our hip or the groin. There's just not a lot of fat there. It's where we bend. So obesity is less of a factor as far as doing surgery. And obviously, if all those things hold true, patients are happier, they tell people about it, and then the snowball goes down the hill. This is how you get to it. So this is that same pelvis. Those are the muscles that we showed at the beginning. That blue, I don't know, piece of glass sitting there demonstrates how you get in. Literally, if you've ever cleaned a deer or, I guess, eating a steak or whatever, you see that silver lining or that silver silver skin, people will call it. That's what separates muscles. And literally, you'll make your incision, you'll take your finger, and you'll wiggle it back and forth. And that's it. You're down on the hip joint. You don't have to cut those muscles. You're basically, you're pulling them apart like a shade, or uh, shades on a window, or blinds, I'm sorry, blinds. Blinds on a window where you pull them side to side. So you pull this muscle that way and that muscle that way, and you get yourself down to the joint. So once again, this is not new. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Perthes uses this in pediatrics or children all the time. He actually uh, was from Milwaukee originally, but he, this approach was our pediatric colleagues used this all the time because they didn't want to cut the muscles on children to get into the hip joint for infection in those things. But what happened is it took time to develop the pediatric guys and us generalists or our joint guys don't really talk much because there's not a whole lot of commonality there, and so uh, kind of fell by the wayside. Well, the engineers got a hold of us and basically designed the instruments where you could get in from the front without cutting the muscles. So the engineers helped a significant amount as far as getting the instruments to do the surgery from the front. All right, so if you're squeamish, this is where you want to turn your head. because This is going to be the surgery. Go ahead. Go back a second, please. Can you bring it back? There you go. Pause it. So anyways, 
Heads up here, you got two feet down here. This is a camera just looking from the top down, okay? This is gonna demonstrate the surgery, is how it's done on a cartoon version, all right? So, we, I wasn't gonna do the live version. All right, go ahead. So once again, head here, two feet down there, lying on your back, their arms are here, but right hip, and what you'll see is, the initial part is just the incision. Once you get through, you'll see a little bit of fat, but you can pull that stuff to the side. And then you see these two muscles, and once again, just like the lamp here in the uh, bite, you're gonna pull in both directions. And at that point, you're down to the ball of the hip, that's a, a saw, unfortunately. <laughs> that uh, you're gonna take the ball out. You gotta get it out somehow. Exactly. It's, it's basically a, a mechanic's dream because you have every tool you want. But now you have a socket. <laughs> to make a socket, you've got to make that round because what you're gonna put in is round. We have sockets up here if you want to look up. But you want to put in a socket that's round. So once you put the socket in, now you've got that half done. You've got to now put in a stem. To put in a stem, you manipulate the leg in a position, we call it a figure four, and then you size it appropriately to the patient. Once it's sized appropriately, you put in the real thing, but now you gotta put a ball on top. And so you put a ball on top, you measure leg lengths and things like that along the way, but then you just bring the leg back to where it was, and you put it back in the socket. And life is good. So obviously there's a lot of steps along the way to get that. It's, oversimplified there but the concept there is if you open the shades to look in you're gonna be okay and then you can range the hip and go it up that ball there's multiple different sizes of balls to uh, help determine stability and leg length there's multiple different sizes of stems and those types of things when that cup went in or that stem went in you saw two surfaces one's a smooth surface and one's a rough surface the rough surface your body is tricked it thinks that's bone and it grows into it or onto it. it uh, we don't cement these in or put glue or anything like that. Your body literally grows onto the thing as well as into the socket. So, all right, Slim. Next, go next. All right, so, well, clearly it can't have that much upside without a downside, right? I mean, that's, nothing's that good in life. So, what are the unique risks? There's extremely an extremely steep learning curve. What's that mean? Well, it means that if a surgeon doesn't at least go do training and learn how to do it in the proper channels to do it, then likely they're going to have a higher rate of complications. And so you can imagine as I came back from Texas, imagine you sitting there in the exam room with me and I say, all right, Jimbo, I've never done this operation before, but I want to do it on you. That's a hell of a conversation that I had. I had it multiple times. But because you, I didn't learn this in residency, and a lot of surgeons don't. So that's a tough conversation to have the first time. It's a tough conversation the second time, the third time, the fifth time. Pretty soon after about 15, 20 times, you stop having that conversation because your comfort level goes up. But clearly, surgery takes longer the first time you do it. The second time you do it, it takes a little bit less until you become a little bit more proficient, and things get thrown at you along the way that are more difficult. But at the same time, <coughs> change is very difficult and uh, changing a surgeon's uh, way to do something is even more difficult. We wouldn't do it if we didn't think it was the right way, right? I don't care if you go from the front, side, back, whatever you do, that's the best for that surgeon and for you if it's in their hands. So to get somebody to change that is a very difficult proposition. To get a, the trust between the patient and the surgeon at that point to change something is a difficult proposition. So I certainly wouldn't tell you that every surgeon should do an anterior approach. I think that's the wrong thing. I think the surgeon who becomes educated and proficient in it will like to do it, but that doesn't mean it's for everybody. It doesn't mean it's for every patient either. Um, so anyways, there's an increased risk as you learn, but most of the literature says that typically after 20 to 30 hips, the risk of problems from an anterior approach is the same from a posterior approach. So that's kind of where the proficiency uh, lines cross. So there is an increased risk. Other small things, uh, they'll talk, if you read the literature about People who poo-poo this idea, they'll say you're injuring a nerve. Well, there's a nerve that goes to the outside of your thigh here that goes to your skin that sometimes it causes numbness in that area, uh, but it doesn't fire any muscles, so it's really a sacrificable nerve that doesn't cause any problems long-term. Uh, that's right, probably the biggest knock, uh, but overall I think the learning curve becomes the biggest issue that can be 
correctly with adju adequate education, surgeon visitation, and all those things that go with it. So, so here are the risks. These are the scary things that can happen. Infection, uh, that one scares the bejesus out of us. No matter what we do and how hard we work, that can creep in. Our knock on wood, um, infection right here is lower, much lower than the averages across the country. Uh, blood clots, blood clots can form in legs, travel to lungs, and unfortunately, you meet your demise and it could kill you. So we work hard to try and prevent blood clots through different modalities. And depending on the patient, it depends on what we use. Implant breakage, this is not as much of a problem now as it was in uh, years ago. Some of these old stems would break at the neck there. You, know, you can imagine you have a 400 pound gentleman or, or a female walking on that, that's not a lot of metal to absorb that energy step after step. But uh, these actually do really well now. Um, uh, premature wear, that's the plastic piece in there. The plastic piece hopefully will last you, it depends on your age, demographic. You know, the younger you are, the more active you are, it's not going to last as long, but you can wear that out sooner. Nothing will last forever. Your brake pads don't last forever on your car, and you know, your tires, you'll wear them out. And the last risk is cardiovascular compromise, and that's more for, so for any surgery, you can have heart troubles, lung troubles, pneumonia, heart attack, all kinds of crazy things like that. And so we always have you see your regular doctor for <coughs> pre-op physical to make sure you can undergo the stress of an operation. Um, slide. So this is kind of, uh, if you have a son, daughter, relative, or whatever, and they're going into medicine or surgery, you probably want to steer them towards orthopedics, because here's two great slides. All right, so if you look at this one, the red line is cabbage, or bypass surgery. I uh, read this slide's a little bit older, but look what's happening to the number of bypass surgeries that are going on in the country. It's going down. Your, my GI colleagues who do hernia repairs, there's really not a lot more hernias going on kind of staying flat. If you look at the number of hip replacements and knee replacement surgeries going on, that's climbing significantly. And if you look at that through 2030, the year 2030, we'll have doubled the number of hip replacements and knee replacement surgeries we do in this country compared to just about uh, 30 years ago. So if you're going into medicine or anything like that, I'd push you towards orthopedics. Plus <laughs> advice. So this is a patient, um, this is, this is not what we want always, but this is what we get sometimes. This is a gentleman who had his hip replaced about two to three hours earlier in this picture. And here he is walking to uh, ACDC Thunderstruck to basically show <laughs> off a little bit. So anyways, we, we won't let you do this here. We put a walker in front of you, starting out. He just had to prove something to his wife who was standing in the corner. So anyway, so you can do those things. Obviously the first two weeks though, we tell you to take it easy. If we replace your hip, Clearly you can buy a new car and drive it 150 miles an hour the first day, but break it in, take your time. Ice it, elevate it, you take it easy those first two weeks. That's what we implore you to do. Because if you get a big swollen leg, there's not much you're gonna do short of lay back down and put it up in the air. Uh, I think that's probably the slide. Oh, here we go, this is a thing, why Riverview? Obviously we're the state-of-the-art joint center. This is a kind of predates Aspirus, no offense because they're the ones who are sponsoring this, but uh, we started the joint program however many years ago now when we were a community uh, Riverview Hospital. I went to Riverview Hospital board and I just asked, I said, please, could you do something for us, for the community? And Aspire says, continue it. Our joint center is second to none. I would argue that time and time again. That board of directors at that point allocated a quarter of a million dollars to start this joint program. I promised them, I may not, I didn't promise, I said, we may not increase the number of people who come here by one, but I can promise you the quality of care we give to every one of those will be much better. So you have specialized care, really you do. The rooms we use, for example, upstairs on the floor, these are small things that you might not notice, but things that took planning. The rooms you use on the floor upstairs, I'm pretty uh, territorial. I don't allow those to be used to other people. You invite other people who are s truly sick, right? because one of the risks is infection. And we don't want patients with pneumonia or wounds or things like that in the room that you're going to be. Number one, number two is we want joint center nurses. We want nurses that take care of orthopedics because it is specialized. It's not fair to you as a patient, at least when I, when I started here, it wasn't fair to the patient if I had a joint replacement in this room and God forbid a heart attack in this room. The nurse has to take care of the heart attack, right? And so that portion who had their joint replaced is really getting shortchanged. So, God bless the uh, Riverview at that time who agreed to go with 
this crazy thought of creating the Joint Center, and thank you to Aspires for continuing something that's actually worked phenomenally throughout the time and evidenced by what we continue to get at health grades and consumer reports. We are up to date. I would challenge that to anything. There's an organization called About Health. Uh, About Health is a statewide organization that gives kind of parameters on how we should do joint replacements and things like that. They actually look to us to how to do a lot of those things. And clearly we have better, better averages nationally, locally, statewide than our competitors. You don't need to travel out of town for uh, great care. Thanks. So um, as far as kind of the wrap up thing, you know, like any good uh, timeshare talk, you can't leave here until you buy a timeshare. But the, uh, the, uh, there's a couple, of, there's goodies still in the back. Please take them so we don't have to take them home. There is a sign up sheet in the back. If uh, you want to be seen for an expedited appointment, what I would do is I'll take that sheet of paper back, as Cindy said, and give it to the staff, and they'll give you a call. Please do me a couple favors when you write on that. Write legibly. <laughs> See, it's common sense from a surgeon to say that, but write legibly. Number two, put your phone number down. That's a real number that will get a hold of you. Because often what happens is we do this, I can't read, or my nurse can't read, or the assistant can't read what you wrote, and then we can't get a hold of you, and it fails miserably. So please do that. Uh, take something with you, and obviously we do have time for questions if people have questions. But when you when you do your question, don't say my hip hurts right here. What's the problem? <laughs> okay, we can't do that all day. All right, any questions at all on that stuff? Yeah. Uh, what, what is the average time at the surgery if you go into the front versus the side? So when I first my first surgery, uh, it was interesting because I've taken pictures many times along, or my assistants taken pictures multiple times along the way, and when I do my talks, and this was inadvertent the first talk I did, or the first surgery I did. There's a clock on the wall, and that clock went two and a half hours from incision to closure, the thing's done. That was now 12 years ago. The average surgery now is 45 minutes to an hour and 10. So it's, it's part of it is it's a dance, right? I mean, any surgery you do is a dance, and the person I've done for the last umpteen years with, I actually haven't in the last, what is it, 2009, uh, 10 years, I haven't done an anterior hip replacement without Dawn, she's not here tonight, but who's my first assist? It's it's a dance. If I don't have to say put the leg here, do this, do this, and we both know what's going on, it goes extremely smoothly. Um, so you would never have an orchestra with a different uh, pianist every time, right? You would never have a, a baseball team with a different first baseman, second baseman every time. So it makes sense to have specialized people doing the same thing. So Dawn and I have been doing it now, the anterior approaches, and she goes and teaches with me as well, and it's phenomenal. So the time is cut down significantly. Well, what's that matter to a patient? Well, if you can cut down the time of the operation, you cut down the infection risk, you cut down blood loss and the chance of transfusion, and obviously if you're doing it over and over again, the tune of what we do almost, I know what the city showed as far as numbers, but Dawn and I will do about 300 joint replacements a year uh, between here and Black River Falls. So you get an idea that pretty soon you become extremely proficient at it and the time that it takes to do the operation goes down. Not because you're speeding through it, don't get me wrong, that's not the goal ever. You take as much time as you need to do it right, but if you've done it time and time again, you become more proficient. Yeah? The question is, do you always have the same anesthesiologist? Well, here at Riverview we have basically four anesthesia providers as well as nurse anesthetist. So you, do I have the same one? Every time, no. They are, they're on a rotating basis. But because we are at the beauty of a small hospital, um, they know exactly what we want, when we want it, and how. And they do it essentially the same way. We typically do surgery under spinal anesthesia, where we numb you from the waist down, but then you're also asleep unless you want to be awake and talking to me throughout the surgery, uh, which is fine. I don't care. Uh, it's just you, you'll have a curtain up so you won't be able to see. <laughs> and people have done that, so that's not a big deal. Yeah. At the beginning of the program, you said that you could tell whether it's a hip or some other part of the back that's causing the problem. Yeah. Is that also apply to the knee? So the question is, does a uh, can you tell uh, if the knee is causing the hip pain? No, if, if the pain in the knee. Oh, it's coming from the hip. Yes. Okay. So the question is, is how do you know if the pain in the knee is coming from the hip? That's a great question. I have that a couple patients today with that very issue. They came in with knee pain, and I don't believe the knee is the problem whatsoever. So how do you decipher who's who? Well, first off, you probably actually both do an exam. But what I did with these two uh, gentlemen, 
as I took them into a room and injected their hip joint with numbing medicine. So if I fill their hip joint with numbing medicine and it makes their knee pain go away, the problem is probably their hip. You could do it the other way and just inject the knee, but you're never going to know. So a lot of people will come in with, uh, and this becomes a difficult thing for insurances when you get prior authorization, a lot of people come in with knee problems and the problem is actually their hip. And so you do, one of the things in North Peak Surgery they talk about is you've got to at least evaluate the joint above and joint below. So if you're looking at a knee, you gotta look at the hip, you gotta look at the ankle. But yeah, you decipher it usually with x-rays, physical exam, sometimes you can go as far as to inject it for two reasons. Num number one, to prove it to the patient that hey, the problem is your hip joint. And number two, to prove it to myself that he'd hate like heck to go replace a, a knee and then probably come back and say, hey, the knee is fantastic, but it still hurts. And then you find out it's the hip, that's a bad day. Yeah. Is there just a overnight stay in the hospital, that's it? Uh, the question is, is, is it just an overnight stay in the hospital? Well, uh, two ways to answer that question. Most persons stay one night. If somebody wants to go home that same day, I don't have any qualms with that. The problem is if they have a support structure and they trust that they'll do what I want, uh, which is the big thing. So we, um, we uh, do, I'd say at the hospital, we do 98 plus percent stay that same night. If you have had the surgery before, many will want to leave that day. Usually what happens is we'll say, you can leave that day, but once they get up to the room and they lie down and they're tired and all those things, that motivation goes away very quickly. So most of them will stay one night. But we do do this as an outpatient often uh, at the uh, surgery center for specialized things. So, question? Yeah. Using the, using the anterior approach, is there much of a concern over blood loss? The question is, uh, with an anterior approach, is there much of a concern with blood loss? Initially there was. Uh, when I first started, it, we weren't really sure what we were going to lose because there, the blood vessels to the anterior hip, there are more. The capsule, what we call the capsule, the area around the hip, has more blood vessels, so there was a risk of increased bleeding. I will tell you that we have not transfused a hip, and probably what I haven't personally, transfused a hip replacement in probably eight years. I don't know when the last one was. So the blood loss, um, I think it has more to do with technique, and the other thing it has to do with medications. About uh, seven years ago, we started a really cheap medication called transexamic acid. But basically, it helps decrease blood loss in the operating room. It came from our surgeon colleagues that do heart surgeries. And it's become very, very, very well used across the board for orthopedic replacements. And so the transfusion rate is, I don't want to say it's zero, but it's bottoming out very quickly. I think if you looked at the literature, I think the transfusion rate nationwide 10 years ago was probably 10%. It's clearly way down, probably tenfold down from that. So, no, I, I don't uh, worry about blood transfusions hardly at all uh, for an anterior hip replacement or a knee replacement at this point. Yeah. Is age a factor in having this done? The question is, is age a factor in having it done? Uh, no, but yes. I mean, like every good answer, right? So, would I run in and do it on a 30-year-old? I'm going to go both spectrums here for you. Would I run in and do it on a 28 or 30 year old with a little bit of arthritis? No, because they're gonna wear that hip out. And every time you operate, they wear it out, the risk goes up. So you wanna try and get those really young people a little bit farther along. For the other side of the spectrum, is there a risk for the uh, 90 year old person? No, we've replaced hips on 90 year old people, no problem. The problem becomes is can they medically undergo the operation? Will their heart and lungs do it? And there's a gentleman who just passed, God rest his soul, who was 90 years old, or 91, 92 years old, when he just replaced his joint. He, he, most of you probably even know the guy in the room, but he, uh, he would drive back and forth to Texas. <coughs> he was 90 plus years old when he replaced his joints. He wanted both of them done because it felt so good. So uh, he, he, then he continued to drive to Texas for the next few years and he just passed away this past year. Um, but anyways, no, so I don't worry about so much the chronological age, it's medically if the patient can undergo the operation. And that's determined between the patient and the medical doctor. And then it has to do with function. So I had a, uh, a person in the room in my office yesterday who was 95. She wanted her hip replaced. Um, unfortunately, she hadn't walked for years. And so that's probably not a realistic person to say, hey, I'm going to replace your hip. You're going to get up and walk around. But if you're a 95-year-old and you walk around, but you can't walk around anymore because the hip pain is so significant, then I would absolutely consider that discussion with the patient, the family, and the regular doctor. One in the back, yeah. Earlier in the presentation, you were talking about over-the-counter pain control. 
Yeah, so the question is, is for over-the-counter medications, why not Tylenol or acetaminophen? Um, acetaminophen is a great pain medication, and if you look at uh, the literature as far as post-operative pain or true pain control, acetaminophen or Tylenol is essentially, per the literature, just as good as Vicodin, which is the Vicodin we've all heard of and, and know. Um, the problem with it for arthritis is it's not anti-inflammatory. So acetaminophen and Tylenol is not an anti-inflammatory product. It will help the pain, no question. But will it decrease the inflammation? No. So I usually start with the anti-inflammatory. If something needs to be added onto it, absolutely go Tylenol. Or if medically the person can't use those medications, absolutely Tylenol. But the first line, I'd use an anti-inflammatory. Great question. Yeah. Can I ask you something? Uh, like, uh, put a salve on your knee or get like that, like hemp oil or so the question is, is do topicals work? Do topical creams work? So whoever comes to see me is paying me to give you kind of what the peer-reviewed literature says. Right? Snake oils have been sold on the street corner for years. Um, do they work? Probably some of them do. Um, but which ones work is the hard part. So. Yes, there's all kinds of topicals out there. Now CBD oil or hemp oil is clearly making a huge push in the market. If I build a, or, or um, a biofreeze or anything like that, and does it work for some people? Absolutely. So I typically say I can't tell you it's going to work or not, and I'm not going to give you that as a treatment to do, but certainly try it on your own accord. And if it works for you, great. But I don't know that I can look you in the eye and tell you it will do anything based on the scientific data. And now CBD oil is making a push right now that that may, you know, might change things a little bit as far as pain control goes. Uh, but until that comes out in the mainstream literature, I certainly wouldn't be the one to, to say, go do it. Now, there are some patients where I say, you know what, you might as well go try it. Sure. Because they can't undergo surgery for whatever reason. You say, you might as well try it. You don't have a lot of bullets in the gun. You might as well try something. And so it's not a bad idea. Yeah. Is there a prescription pain medicine or sent home to get or? You mean after surgery? Yeah. So the question is, is there a prescription pain medication after surgery? I am as anti-narcotic as they come <laughs> as far as pain medications after surgery and even more so before. So that raises a great question. All you got to do is read the news and, and talk about how narcotics are a huge problem in the state, the country, the city, whatever. So I don't use narcotics for lots of reasons and certainly I don't recommend pain medications before an operation. When I say pain medications, I don't mean Tylenol, Aleve, and Ibuprofen. If you're on pain medications for whatever reason, whatever reason you and your medical doctor think you need to be on Tramadol, Vicodin, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, Percocet, whatever it is, exit stage left. I don't want to do your surgery. There's a huge reason why. That person will have a worse outcome than anyone else. That person will need more pain pills, but have a worse outcome than anyone else. So we like persons to be drug free or narcotic free for 30 days prior to surgery. After surgery, the question goes, I'm not that barbaric. Bar barbaric, yes, you get pain pills afterwards. It's kind of your Easter candy afterwards, I don't know what you want to say. But anyways, so afterwards, we typically use a medication called Tramadol. Tramadol is not a narcotic, well, technically it is now, I guess. Tramadol is not considered the narcotic as like the Vicodin or uh, Percocet and things of that sort. It's tolerated a little bit better. It doesn't make you quite as woozy. It doesn't constipate you as much, but clearly it's effective. With the Tramadol, often we'll add Tylenol because those two work in synergy very well and take care of the pain. 90 plus percent, to well more than 90 plus percent of all joint replacements, hips and knees, will take Tramadol plus or minus Tylenol plus or minus ibuprofen without the need to escalate it to things like Vicodin, Percocet, or those things. And the reason being is we do a lot of different things in the surgery that that really you're unaware of. I mean, from the incision to where it goes, to how we touch the muscles, to where we put the retractors, to what we inject with at the end of the operation, all of those things play a role in your post-operative pain. And you, it's not the same surgery. I'm not doing it the same now as I did five years ago, as I did three years ago. Things come along in the pipeline that are going to make it a better experience for you. Something as simple as a, this is crazy, but 
about 10 years ago, I switched to a dressing where a patient could shower. So you, instead of putting a dressing on where they couldn't shower, put a dressing on where they can shower the day after surgery. My business skyrocketed because Dylan was the guy who allowed people to shower. You know, things like that that are patient satisfiers become a big deal. But even in surgery, we do a lot of things to keep the pain level low. So when you wake up, it's not miserable. Now, I'm not going to say it's, you know, teddy bears and, and pillows and clouds and things like that. It hurts, but we try really hard to make it so it's a tolerable experience. And uh, for the most part, 99 plus percent will get through with not much difficulty. Any more questions before we release? Yeah. Do all the surgeons the question is, do all the surgeons at the office perform the anterior approach? The answer is no. Um, we all do it a little bit differently. We're all um, born of different shells, but no, they don't. Or we don't, I should say. And uh, it's just a matter of pro uh, surgeon preference. Uh, the one thing I will say as far as uh, recovery, I guess I didn't mention that. Uh, Cindy touched on it, but we really push you to go home I uh, don't send anybody to nursing homes afterwards. It's not because they don't like nursing homes. It's just you don't need to be there. You lived in pain before the operation. Pain afterwards, you can get around just like you did before. So I'm very much anti-nursing uh, home following a joint replacement surgery. So. All right. And without any other questions, once, twice. All right. So please, in the back, if you want to uh, sign the form, if you want us to give you a call, take whatever's left. If, what, wait, wait one second. Who's a double XL? Anybody? <laughs>